Some of the best stories are big beefy boys with floating head sidekicks, Kratos and Mimir, Crash Bandicoot and Uka Uka, of course, but have you heard of the black samurai Yasuke and his misadventures in saving the floating head of his former boss, the demon king Oda Nobunaga? Born in Mozambique, Yasuke began working for Nobunaga as the person who holds his weapons. That's not the only thing he would hold. When Nobunaga and Yasuke met for the first time, it was like Rush Hour 2, they became best buds. We're just gonna forget the fact that he made him undress in front of us. Nobunaga was betrayed by his general and had to commit seppuku, which I don't know if you know what that is. Before he died, the warlord asked Yasuke to take his head to his son. Yasuke would have had to steal the head from the evil general. Imagine the severed head giving out warnings while Yasuke fights off waves of evil samurai. Here's one of my favorite history mysteries, Yasuke. Wow, oh man. Super strength, super speed, intelligence in combat. And the wise floating head of his boss, Nobunaga. If you didn't know about black superheroes from history, you probably don't know about the racist robot from history. Every time I look up a story of a badass woman, they get more badass. There was an organized crime syndicate of only women called the 40 Elephants. Sadly, there was no pachyderm. It was just the name of the pub that they frequented. When she was 20 years old, Diamond Alice took over. You know why her nickname was Diamond Alice? She wore diamond rings on all her fingers to fist fights, which she constantly had. One time she was almost caught by the police, but she got away by hiding the diamond rings in the cop's pocket. You know those big hats and the big poofy dresses? that they had back in the day. They would steal stuff, put it in the, in the dresses, in the butt part and the hat part. And a Bobby would show up and he'd be all like, Oi, what's all this said? Nothing ever! It's me, it's me trousers! You cheeky monkey! But their main superpower was that they had a third arm for steal. I give you Diamond Alice! Oh, she's a flapper girl! She's flapping! You got one arm stealing, you got a second one stealing, and the third one is also as it's shooting people! What's more lethal than a Tommy gun is those heels! Jesus! It amazes me that they forget to tell you the badass parts of history, specifically that the most famous missing persons case might have ended in the most OP fight to the death ever. Scientists are pretty sure that they just found where Amelia Earhart might have crash landed. Amelia Earhart's pretty cool. She pulled a Phineas and Ferb when she was a kid by making a wooden roller coaster in her backyard. Plus the whole flying thing. She went missing when she tried to fly around the entire planet in 1937. One of the most promising tools in figuring out what happened to her might actually be the thing that ate her. The one reason I think we should destroy the world, the coconut crab. Scientists today believe that Amelia starved and that Mr. Krabs came along and made her into a Krabby Patty. But in my stupid crazy artist mind, I can't help but think what would it look like if she was still alive fighting off those monsters. Imagine you pull yourself in the fiery wreckage of your crashed plane and you're surrounded by a horde of monsters and all you can do is roll up your sleeves and shout, let's get it on, come get me. Here is the greatest fight to the death ever, Amelia Earhart. You get him, girl. Her life isn't the movie Castaway, it's the movie I am legend. Back you spawn of Satan. Shrimp casserole away from me. Someone give me a fork and some dipping sauce. I'm gonna eat their ass. No, don't say that out loud. You thought the badass women who made the Nazis think they were witches were cool? You're gonna have to buckle up for the first American who discovered a comet after she saved a town from an explosion. You would think having a comet named after you would be the coolest thing that's ever happened in your life, but she defused a bomb in front of a mob during a fire. During the Great Fire of 1846, a crowd of men thought an explosion would stop the fire from spreading. Come on! The girl boss stood in between the mob and the explosives. Thanks to her scientific background, she could tell the wind changed and she was like, stop it, stop that. Because all the men in Nantucket were wailing, she had the right to vote, she owned property, and when she learned that men were making more than her, she asked for a raise and got it. She didn't boycott, she girl got it. I'm not surprised, she was cold. She often wrote about how better women were at science than men. The biggest Eminem mic drop was when she wrote an article on men looking at the sun and they shake. Her students don't, because guess what, they're women. The only way that her she students could do this was if she invented a camera that could look at the sun, so she did. Not only could she see black spots in the sun, but she saw white spots in her town. When the real life Starfire heard that her town's public school was segregated, she said, not on my island, and she created a school for colored kids. I'd go straight to heaven and hang out with her and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I thought this girl boss from history deserved to be drawn as a superhero, so I gave her the power to summon meteors and comets and use her astronomical predictions to see into the future. Without further ado, here is Maria Mitchell. Oh my god, the fire, look out! She's so badass, I didn't even mention that she has a gold medal from the king. Did it hurt when you fell from the stars? I know you can't scientifically fall from the stars, no, I was just flirting with you. No, wait, just one date. No, God, no. Have you ever been 
gotten so freaked out that you just immediately assume it's a ghost? You just hear something and immediately go, no big ghost energy. This happened to the Nazis. There was a female only pilot brigade that was so good at fighting the Nazis in World War II that they thought they were witches. The Russian Amelia Earhart Marina Raskova got a bunch of letters from women saying, I wanna kick some Nazi ass. They got the band together and they became the first official women to fight in World War II. Due to misogyny, they could only fly hand-me-down crop dusters, which were no better than paper airplanes. They might have been called coffins with wings, but they were practically invisible. That's because these women could only fly at night or else they would be seen immediately and they had to turn off their engines. They flew without the engines on. The Nazis were so scared, they thought the canvas airplanes were actually broomsticks of witches. And when they found out they were pilots, they were like, well, they must be getting injections of night vision potion. They didn't even fly with parachutes. The craziest part is they had to climb out on the wings sometimes to physically drop the bombs. That's insane to me. The most decorated unit in the Soviet Air Force, their main rule was to be proud to be a woman. Come on. Even though they were only around for six months, the night witches forced the Nazis to retreat because they were so scared of them in certain battles. Can you imagine being beat up by these women and thinking, well, they must be mutants. <laughs> These ladies were so badass, they deserved to be drawn as superheroes. What if they did have the power to see at night? And what if they had a little magic as well? I'm gonna draw them with the ability to control airplanes from afar. Here are the night witches. Oh, God, yes! Do you wanna go out for a spell? Maybe grab some air? The sky's the limit. Okay, all right. Okay, I get it. The Do you have that voice inside your head that tells you to veer into oncoming traffic? It's the same brain that makes you think life is a cartoon. If I rob a bank, I'm gonna wear a bunch of metal so I'm bulletproof. There was a man who survived hours of gunfight with an army of policemen because he wore metal and was bulletproof 200 years ago. And Kelly the Iron Outlaw took life by the balls and he was handsome. Look at the swirl. Ned Kelly was a bush ranger. Just imagine GTA, but in Australia. Back when Australia meant corrupt prison, Ned Kelly became one of the most infamous gang leaders because he made a bulletproof suit out of farm tools. That's badass. In one of his last gunfights, people thought he was a ghost when he came out of the fog against an army of policemen and no one could shoot him. Nedward must have been taking notes from Iron Man because he knew that one suit was not cool enough. He did not play solo in Fortnite. He squatted up. It's like henchmen from a Batman villain. Come on. The biggest thing you might notice is his groin guard. That's important. Specifically because when he started his career in the crimes, the officers tackled him to the ground and one of them yanked his chain and he never forgot. Also, his best friend got taken out of the game forever when he got shot in the groin. A man's worst nightmare. Ned, this armor's kind of heavy. More around the pelvis. It weighs a hundred pounds. More pelvis! Sure, he kept hostages, but he bought them drinks and danced with them all night. Historians today still argue whether he was a criminal big baddie waddy. Or, or, whether a villain or a hero, someone's gonna draw him with superpowers as a comic character. Imagine being the guy that has to face the Australian gang of robot people. Here is Ned Kelly. Oh my, yes! Wow! And you gotta protect the boys. I, for one, reserve judgment on if he was a good guy or a bad guy to the historian. What? You heard that? No, I trust you. You're a good guy. No, not the groin! Ah! We learned about a guy with swords for hands. A medieval knight with a robot hand. Today I'm gonna tell you about a woman with normal hands. What'd she do with those hands? She saved Abraham Lincoln from assassination. The, the first time. Kate Warren was the world's first female detective. Sherlock Holmes, more like Herlock Holmes. Sherlock? Sheila? Her superpower was that she was a master of disguise. To solve crime, this super spy dressed up as soldiers, fortune tellers, and old ladies. I see your future. You will be caught for murder by me, Kate Warren, first female detective. Before he became a president, Detective Kate discovered that secessionists were trying to assassinate him before he got to Washington. She even found out that they planned to use poisonous ink or spiders or knives or bullets, whatever they could to kill him. That's literally all the things. It was called the Baltimore plot, and Kate protected the president by playing dress up with him. She stayed up all night protecting the president so well that Pinkerton started calling themselves the detectives that never sleep. Not to be confused with detectives in New York. This shape-shifting super spy deserves to be a superhero. Most awesome thing was 60 years before there was a female police officer, she convinced the Pinkertons to create an entire wing of female detectives. She was a badass. Here is Kate Warren. Ah, oh, she's on the train now. Mr. President, we got him. <gasps> is that a telescope disguised as a pistol? Nope, that is just a pistol. Ah, the president liked the play. Oh my God, no. Oh, don't tell Kate. What superhero from history should we draw next? guy with swords for hands from 300 years ago was cool. You're gonna have to change your pants when you hear about the cyborg knight whose catchphrase was lick my ass. <laughs> Imagine 
Imagine Robocop with the attitude of Ron Swanson. Godfrey von Berlichingen, and I'm probably messed that up, is a mercenary knight from the 1500s who had his arms shot off by a cannon during a siege. Most people would retire at that point, but God's just got a robot hand. Being a cell sword, you're gonna piss a couple people off on the other side, and when they came to kidnap him, he was like, oh, who do you work for, that guy? He can lick my ass. His iron hand could be opened and closed to use shields, but also was delicate enough to write poetry with. Roses are red, my robot hand is sick. If you want to fight me, my ass, you have to. He cared so little about what people thought of him that when he was outlawed by the Holy Roman Empire, his friends got him unoutlawed, and yet he immediately kidnapped a bishop. Please don't kidnap me. You know what I'm gonna say, right? No, you don't have to say you can lick my ass. His nickname in English means guts, and if a cyborg knight named Guts sounds familiar, you'd be correct. Come on, you know you're a badass if they base a manga character after you. You know I had to draw this cyborg from medieval times as a superhero. I imagine him as a cyborg version of Hellboy, but he has a heart of gold just like the Tin Man. Maybe with a few upgrades he could shoot a laser. Here's one of my new favorite people from history, Gots. Oh my god! <laughs> In my opinion, it shouldn't have been Gots. His nickname should have been Goat. I wonder what he said before he invented Kiss My Ass. Probably something like, mm, shut up. <laughs> Uh, no, you are. Moral of the story is say something badass occasionally because 500 years in the future, you might be remembered for it. There was a guy who had swords for hands in real life. Wolverine had nothing on him. I'm gonna try and not butcher the names. Galvarino was a Mapuche warrior from Chile in the 1500s. The 1500s. Conquistadors showed up looking like Magneto and he was like, no, no, get away from me. They saw he was a brave warrior and they cut off his hands to send a message to the leader of the Mapuche. This just made him angrier, obviously. So he went to his leader and he said, give me an army and we'll go fight the guys. Not only that, he tied swords to hit the nubs of his severed hands. Their army faced against guns and horses and he still went to the front of the line and he was quoted for saying, I'm gonna use my teeth. He ended up cutting down the second in command and the Mapuche are still fighting to this day. This superhero from history deserves a glow up and what better way than glowing hot metal from cutting conquistadors? Here's the coolest history mystery, Galvarino. Oh my God. I told you, you don't need the blades. Those pecs could cut diamonds. What history mystery should we draw next? I hate all magicians, except for Harry Houdini, because he was a ghostbuster. Welcome back to History and Mysteries, where I draw historical figures as the superheroes that they were. One of Houdini's favorite hobbies was beating up psychics. Houdini loved showing the frauds of psychics and fortune tellers of the time so much that he would wear disguises and sneak in and then unveil himself and say, ha ha, that's BS. Weiss, AKA Harry Houdini, was an amazing magician. And I don't like magicians because they're just liars. Except for Harry Houdini because he went out of his way to show that these things are just hocus pocus. It's not real. One day Harry Houdini wanted to talk to his dead mom. So he went to a seance so that the psychic could reach out to the beyond. When his mom started talking through the psychic and saying, Harry, I miss you, I love you. That's when Harry Houdini flipped his shit because his name's not Harry. It's just amazing. From that day forward, Harry Houdini spent his weekends targeting four fortune tellers, psychics, seances, and people who could talk to the dead, and proving that they were just doing magic tricks. He even went to the president of the United States and said, hey, I can do a seance, and then he does it really well. And the president was like, was that real? And Houdini's like, no, ghosts aren't real. He hated psychics so much that he broke off his bromance with his best friend, Arthur Conan Doyle, author of Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle's wife was a psychic, and Conan Doyle was like, uh, Houdini, you're my best pal, but I gotta tell you, my wife's a psychic, and it's really real. And Houdini's like, I'm sorry, bro, but <laughs> your wife's an idiot. She's not doing anything. It's a lie. She's lying. Then they became rivals. He got an arch nemesis. Not only that, but he hired a detective for his sidekick. It's amazing. Rose Mackenberg and Harry Houdini teamed up so that they could just tell all the world that psychics are fakes. Harry Houdini was great at magic tricks, but Mackenberg was great at Master of Disguise stuff. They went on adventures. What the hell? Last cool thing about Harry Houdini, he taught the US military magic. The president said, do you want to teach our military how to break out of these traps? Houdini taught the US military how to escape out of sinking ships and chains from being a prisoner of war. What? The, he had an army of magicians. But enough history. It's time to draw this superhero. Last time we drew super genius Grace Hopper. But today we're drawing Harry Houdini and Rose Mackenberg. Go! Ghostbusters extraordinaire, fighting the undead. Also, one of his best tricks was breaking out of a dead whale. I see Harry as a Mysterio character and Rose as a mystique. Conan Doyle, meanwhile, is his big scary kingpin. And with a little magic, oh! Here's my drawing of Harry Houdini. Go, <laughs> 
admire the guy so much now. He's just the coolest. And a master of disguise, Ghostbuster, come on! He has a villain already! Just look him up more, it's incredible. What history of mystery should I draw next? Fun fact, one of the first cases of having a computer bug was an actual bug! Last time on History Mysteries, we drew the terror of Terrar. But I need some wholesome eye bleach, so today we're gonna draw Grace Hopper, the computer bug fighting super genius. Before I draw this superhero from history, let me tell you why she deserves her own comic book. I've been waiting to do this one. Grace Hopper was a badass. Her nickname was Amazing Grace because she was the smartest person in the room. She got her master's and PhD in math and physics at Yale! They named the supercomputer after her because she was so smart, and they named a missile destroyer after her because she's a badass. When World War II broke out, she got out her fighting gloves, but the Navy said you can't join, you're too old. But boy, does she get her comeuppance later. Instead, she joined the Naval Reserves where she helped build Mark I, which was one of the first computers ever. But something went wrong. There was a bug in the system. Literally, there was a bug in the system. It's one of the first documented cases of a computer bug, and Grace Poole and her team were one of the first people to debug a computer. One of her biggest flexes was when all the guys said, you can't teach a computer English. They only understand math. But Grace just gave him the side eye and said, no, I'm gonna invent the first compiler language-based code in computers. Look at her level of sass. Just look at the sass, look at her. People she worked with described her as working in the Navy, but having the heart of a pirate. She tried to retire three times, but they kept getting her back on active duty because she was so necessary. She kept working until she was one of the oldest people on active duty in US history. They told her she was too old twice in her early career, and then she became the oldest person there. Like, come on. But enough history, it's time to get to drawing a superhero. I thought I'd give Grace a glam up with the ability to control computer bugs from her own glowing cathode ray. The moth that Grace and her team found was attracted to staying inside the computer because of heat and light. I imagine her computer bugs could be used like the fireflies in Monster Hunter. Every hero needs a sidekick, so I made her computer program a robot. But Grace I always said it wasn't her inventions of the compiler or computer programs that was her favorite invention. It was her ability to inspire others to go into STEM jobs and be interested in computer programs like Moths to a Flame. After she retired, she would go on to educate people on nanoseconds and how fast electricity moved in code. Now every hero needs a villain, so I thought she'd be fighting electric crazy ants sent by Nazis to go infest computers on Navy ships. And that's the only part of the story that's fictional, other than the fact that Nazis did plan on using insects in biological warfare against the U.S. Without further ado, here is Grace Hopper. Oh my god, what? I love the fit, I love the face, I love everything about her. I'm thinking Grace is the confident sassy one and Coble is the one who's like, uh, this doesn't compute, I don't think this is sanitary. And the ability to control actual computer bugs is just super cool to me. Go ahead and tell me in the comments, which superhero from actual history should I draw next? So there's a story about these two kids that came out of the forest that were green. They spoke an unknown language, but people eventually learned that they were saying they were from an underground civilization. What is the science behind a green person? And how is it related to the superpower that you actually have right now? And how can I draw them as a superhero? Last time we drew the real life super soldiers with glowing wounds. This is the history mystery of the green children of Woolpit. It's medieval times. In the 12th century Suffolk. Two kids come stumbling out of the woods speaking a language that no one understands. They're super weird because all they do is eat beans. And also they're green. When the people started feeding them other foods, they stopped being green. Sadly, after a bit, the younger brother got sick and died. The story ends with the younger girl growing up and getting married and saying that she actually came from an underground civilization called the Land of St. Martin. When questioned further, Agnes said, her name, is, her name is Agnes. Agnes said that they had Christian churches and a bunch of flocks of sheep, but that the sun never shined on their country and they lived in a perpetual twilight. But what made Agnes and her little brother green? It could be just a story and that never happened. But I think they had hyperchromic anemia. Hyperchromic anemia is where you don't have enough iron in your blood and so your pigments start to decrease. It used to be called chlorosis or the green sickness because people would turn green. They were denutrified. They didn't need anything other than beans. But I'm gonna be drawing them as superheroes. So what if it was cooler than that? You might not know this, but humans are bioluminescent. The human metabolism coupled with our daytime and nighttime cycles creates a chemical reaction with lipids in our body that actually produce photons. That means we glow a little. And if you're watching this in the afternoon, that means you're glowing right now. So if I'm making Agnes Barr as a real life She-Hulk, I'm just gonna stick with glowing skin. I've been reading a lot of Hellboy, so I'm gonna base it off of Mike Mignola's very inky style. The story is 900 years old, so it's a bit in question. But people described Agnes Barr as rebellious and independent for the time. What would happen 
happen if she tried to find her original underground home? Would she find the underground land of St. Martin filled with green people? Or would she travel a mile north to find Fordham St. Martin? A land where around 1173, everyone was massacred and the children just kind of wandered into the forest and spoke medieval Dutch, hiding in tin mines and getting anemia. Who knows? Without further ado, here is Agnes Barr, the real life She-Hulk. Oh man, wacka! Agnes, you don't look too good. You look a little green. Okay, a lot green. You look a lot, it's a lot of green. Did Agnes exist for real or was it just a story? And what historical superpower should I draw next? Comment below, I'll see you tomorrow. What is the coolest way to get taken out? If your one job was to live, imagine being permanently retired by fireworks. In comes Sophie Blanchard, the 19th century balloonist. Girl boss was living life like a Ghibli film. Only Miyazaki and Sophie Blanchard could think of balloons with butterfly wings. He was famous for going up with fireworks. He fell in love with a balloonist, but when God blocked him from the server via gravity, she said, well, the show must go on. He almost froze to death in the air, survived drowning in a swamp. I don't know if you saw this coming. Her last big show, the fireworks caught fire, which is in the name. Her balloon pulls a Hindenburg. That was the day they added the word plummeting to the dictionary. But I think a woman who flew around and shot fireworks in the sky deserves a lot more than that kind of tragedy. Let's give her some razzle-dazzle like Jubilee from X-Men. Here is the extremely flammable Sophie Blanchard. Oh, come on, that's gorgeous. For real, if I had superpowers, I would like to shoot fireworks out of my hands. What superhero from history should I draw next? Come on. Imagine you're cracking open a cold one with the boys. Whack! An axe comes through the door. You and the boys are ready for a bar fight, but then you hear- Hello, Zitters! It's Granny Hatchet! Terry Nation was a prohibition supervillain. My name's Casey, I draw superheroes from history. Get a lot of requests for Joan of Arc, who had a costume and superpowers. Carrie Nation was Joan of Arc if she was a villain of the week. We've all learned it's the lame ones you gotta watch out for. Carrie Nation was told from God to carry the nation by grabbing rocks and a hatchet and destroying everything like Godzilla. She was arrested 30 times in four states for destroying bars and became Granny Hatchet. Here is the very forgotten but very cool Granny Hatchet. Oh my. I've got God and anime on my side. My favorite anime would probably be Chainsaw Man. Wait a second. She lived in the 20s and she had the superpower of a hatred for alcohol. Do you realize who her nemesis would be? Who was the last person on the Titanic? And what was his superpower? Welcome back to History Mysteries. Today we're gonna draw the real life human torch who saved a bunch of people from the Titanic. When the unsinkable Titanic started to sink, it's Chief Baker, with the mustache that would make Ron Swanson proud, had decided to start getting drunk with moonshine. He noticed women and children were afraid to get into the lifeboats, so he threw them off the side of the Titanic, as well as 50 deck chairs to float on. When he was properly shwasted, this drunk guy held onto the side of the Titanic until it sank all the way, and his body was so full of alcohol that he survived hypothermia. When nurses noticed he didn't have a scratch on him and he was perfectly fine even though in ice cold waters, I thought he would be a perfect human torch. Here is Charles Jogon. What in the baker's dozen? He is on fire. I enjoy that the life vest looks like a six pack. Where's that iceberg? I can take it. He didn't have to throw anyone. He just had to stare them down. What other history mysteries should I draw? Tell me in the comments. Also, I just want to say that there was a Halloween outfit for children. He was drunk. That's chat. That's illegal somehow. Have you ever been in an argument and then halfway through the argument you realize, oh, I am on the wrong side. And this guy realized that he led an armed rebellion against the white settlers of Australia back in 1895. Jandamara is like Luke Skywalker and Simba and Moses put together. Before Jandamara became a superhero, he was actually working for the police. As an expert tracker, he was helping the police chain up people stealing livestock. Turns out it was a form of rebellion against white settlers by his own people. Jandamara pulls a 180 when he realizes this and leads his people in guerrilla warfare. Three years into the rebellion, they shoot him and he hides in a cave to survive. Comes back from the dead and they believe he's got superpowers. They say he can fly, bullets can't touch him, and he turns invisible. So white colonists hired another mystical aboriginal. Two magic warriors fighting to death. The story does not end well for Jandamara, but he was a real superhero for his people. Here is Jandamara. Oh man. Wow. Listen, I'd love to go camping with you sometime. You teach me how to track and I'll catch you up on JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. Wait, where are you going? Jane Jane, come back. It's a good anime. It's just nuance. Come on.
Did you know that there was a guy struck by lightning seven times and he lived? Did you also know that I might have missed my jury duty because um, I was drawing someone with lightning powers? Last time on History Mysteries, we drew Harry Houdini. But now it's time to skip responsibility and draw Roy Sullivan, the Spark Ranger. Roy became a park ranger in 1936 at the Cheyenne National Park. It was here where he would become a victim of battery. <clears throat> here is a list of the shocking events that took place over the course of his 35 year career. You see, I said shock. 1942, his tower got hit like eight times and he tried to run, but then he got shocked. 1969, lightning bolt missed his car, shot him through the window, and he almost fell off a cliff. 1970, he was just leaving his house and a lightning bolt ricocheted off the power cable. 1972, he was inside the park ranger station and he still got struck. 1973, he tried running away from a cloud he thought was chasing him and it still got him. 1976, he was convinced a cloud was chasing him and it shot him with lightning. 1977, he was fishing in a lake when he got struck by lightning and then attacked by a bear while his head was on fire! Dude got struck by lightning so many times that his only friend was a bucket of water because his head kept catching on fire! Five times out of seven he got turned to Ghost Rider. So how could this even happen? Statistically, he was really likely to be struck by lightning. Especially Roy, because being a park ranger, you're surrounded by trees, but you're gonna get struck by lightning. Especially that time he was at the lake holding a metal rod, like that's the main one that you would get struck at. America's pretty up there in lightning strike. Let alone Virginia. And most people getting struck by lightning is when it ricochets off a tree and goes, Oh my god! Once is understandable, but seven Seven times? That's more likely than getting the lottery ticket three times! Ah, but that's possible too. In fact, it's, it's super possible. If I were to science fiction it, maybe Lightning loved to give him jazz hands because he had a lower electrical resistance. I wouldn't be surprised if Roy was built different. There's three medical marvels on Stanley Superhumans that have electro resistance, and that show was amazing! But enough history, it's time to draw! What if Roy was inspired to use his lightning attracting powers against the forces of evil? Since he constantly had to watch out for his head catching on fire, I thought that'd be a cool aesthetic to use as a super power. I gave him a scythe because the only thing that protected him other than a bucket of water was the first time he ever got shot by lightning. He was in a field with his dad before he was a park ranger and it struck his scythe, missing his body completely. It was the first time he got shot by lightning and it was also the one time he narrowly escaped being injured. Yet the coolest thing about Roy was that he fought off 22 bears in his life as a park ranger. Not only did he attract lightning, but he also attracted the wildlife. And who could forget his arch nemesis, the sky? Without further ado, here is Roy Sullivan, the Spark Park Ranger! Very nice to meet you, Roy! No, I don't want a handshake. No, I can't. No, I physically- Look out, there's an avalanche of bears behind you! Quick, Roy, be like a toaster and just dive in! What superhero from history should I draw next? Uh, Roy, you speak lightning, right? Ask him, uh, what's up? What? There is a surprising amount of super soldiers in history. Some have been spookier than others. I'm looking at you, Tarar! Did you know that a king tried to breed an army of giants? King Joffrey tried to make attack on titans in real life. Frederick William I of Prussia, or as I call him, Freddy Willy Crazy Ass, was obsessed with recruiting an army of people with gigantism. He probably had the best basketball team in history, but he was evil. Dude started getting weird when he tried breeding giant men and women. He'd make her climb his beanstalk. If you weren't tall enough, he would stretch you on a rack. Who's gonna tell him that's not how that works. It was like the Spartan program, but in the 1700s. A bunch of them trying to run away, but if they did, he would cut off their noses. It's kind of hard for a giant to escape without being seen. Luckily, over 200 giants escaped, and they eventually got their freedom when the king died. Here is the Potsdam Giants. Oh, yes. Wow. Don't worry, big guy. We're gonna get you out of here. If I could go back in time, I'd like to be the founding titan and release all of them. What history mystery should I draw next? <laughs> If you ever got struck by lightning, you're probably thinking, that's what I'm gonna be famous for. Everyone's gonna remember that. In the early 1800s, a girl got struck by lightning, and you know what she's famous for? Finding dinosaurs. There are tons of stories of women from history who sound like superheroes. Mary Anning was called the Princess of Paleontology. She was only 12, 12 when she found an ichthyosaurus skull. After that, it was all science. She just brought dinosaurs back from the dead and made all of Europe interested. Discovered a whole ass plesiosaur. And discovered a new pterosaur. She fought the patriarchy all the Away, and people think, wow, she's super smart. You know where she got that from? Being struck by goddamn lightning. Other than fighting for feminism, she invented the study of corporal light, which, I mean, you can guess what it is. More importantly is that she had one self-portrait, and you know what she did? She took it with her puppy. She said, look, this is my good boy. He used to look up bones with her. I gotta draw them. Also, there might be a movie of her kissing Saoirse Ronan. Saoirse? Saoirse. Saoirse. I don't know, it's gay and beautiful. Because Mary Annie had a real life superhero origin story of getting struck by lightning, I wanted to use that spark and electricity to fuel her superpower of bringing back dinosaurs from the dead, just like she did in the hearts of people that knew her. Here is Mary Anning. Oh my. <laughs>
Oh, yes, the puppy! Dinosaur necromancer. Need I say more? She'd say, men, I've got a bone to pick with you. Where's the dog? You're not the dog. Not the dog. There he is. What the puppy? Oh, my God! What superhero from history should I draw next? Almost 200 years ago, the last survivors of a bloody battle walked away with glowing blue wounds. It's one of my favorite stories of real life superpowers, even though the explanation is a lot like the chest bursters from Alien. It's like the real life plasmids from Bioshock. Today I'll be drawing the history mystery of the angel's glow. In 1862, 20,000 people died over the course of two days. And just like an M. Night Shyamalan movie, the only few survivors that walked away had superpowers. After surviving hypothermia and infection, these super soldiers walked away with glowing wounds and they thought that they were touched by angels. A couple centuries later, we know it's not angels. The angels were actually a bacteria known as Photorhabdus luminescens, which is a lot like the xenomorph from Alien. Parasitic nematodes actually use this symbiotic algae to eat its host from the inside with acid. You heard it right, the chest burster from Alien is real. These two work together to kill their host and eat it from the inside and explode out. Scientists today know that it was really cold that night and the bacteria were looking for a nice place to sleep so they just crawled into the bodies of the soldiers. The survivors were basically freezing to death so their bodies were kind of the perfect temperature for the bacteria to hide in to survive the cold night. Were too big to be eaten by them so it just cleaned their wounds and gave them antibiotics. The super soldiers would have died that night from infection but their glowing blood protected them. So instead of- oh sorry. So instead of eating the soldiers alive from the inside, it actually kept them alive. Much like the game Bioshock has plasmids made from sea slugs, these soldiers walked away glowing with superpowers of healing. I swear, it's like the coolest thing I've ever read. I think this story deserves to be drawn like a super soldier out of a comic book. I love fun facts from history, so if you guys know any other crazy stories about people that might seem like it could be interpreted like superpowers, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. I'm sure there's plenty of other stories throughout history that could be explained with science that back then they thought was basically magic. Whether it's the mysterious children from Woolpit who had green skin and said they were from an underground civilization, or whether it's Rasputin, who was stabbed a bunch, shot, poisoned, and yet still walked away before he died. Tell me in the comments who you think I should draw next, because I'm sure that history is full of mysteries. Without further ado, here is Shiloh. Oh, that guy, oh man. I was gonna call him Angel, but he's a little spookier than that. And it was like the Civil War, so he's got a sword. I think swords are cool. And the giant worm, that's like more conceptual than anything. It's a symbol. It's a symbol. It's a symbol. Tell me in the comments if you know of any other history mysteries. invented a whole bunch of things that changed the world, revolutionized hair care, and has probably saved your life. How has no one made a Marvel movie for this guy yet? We're gonna draw another superhero from history. Garrett Morgan invented the gas mask and stoplight and literally jumped into fires to save people. So today I'm gonna draw him as a superhero. Other than being the perfect sandwich of Iron Man and Batman, we're gonna design him like his original invention, the gas mask. Out of anyone in history, I think this guy would become a mass vigilante. Maybe he could control time with his stoplight powers. After helping firefighters, he probably gets the perk of wielding a giant axe. With his red light, green light powers, think more it's Doctor Strange rather than the robot from Squid Games. This genius inventor from history becomes the super badass of mystery. I give you Garrett Morgan. He's amazing. Thank you, Ryan, for blessing the world with the knowledge that this man existed. And go ahead and let me know which superhero from history For the last day of Pride Month, here's a quick story about this flag. Wait, this one, yes. Imagine you are a bisexual female disguised as a manly pirate. You fall in love with a dashing young man and you reveal your gender to them as a female. He takes off a wig and reveals he is also female and now you are both kissing. That's how Mary Reed and Anne Bonny realized they were the perfect pirate pair. Bisexual pirates and or pirates, these two ladies fought harder and swore more often than every male on their crew. The most badass part is that these ladies would flash their knockers whenever they defeated another pirate or sailor. Just to rub it in their face. Well, not rub it in their face. Comment below your favorite gay hero from history. Here is Mary Reed and Anne Bonnie. Go! I bet they made a lot of pirate booty jokes. Mary, you set my heart on fire. I last, but you're the spark in me, Flint Lock. That was really bad, but I still love you. And I you, Annie. Now let's show our boobies. In 1976, a bus crashed with a hundred people on it. And a world record Olympic athlete finishing his 13 mile run saw it 
and jumped in the sewage infested waters. He pulled out 46 people, 20 of them survived. Going up and down 30 feet with glass in the water gave him pneumonia. Seemed like he would never swim again, but he broke a world record after that. Two years before that, the Olympian saved another bus that was falling off a cliff. Two buses, 37 gold medals at 24, and in 1985, he saved people from a burning building. Here is Shavarj Karapetian. Oh my god. This drawing is fantastic. His face is amazing. So much detail. Like tail, like a mermaid tail. Tell me in the comments if you know another story where someone has abilities and uses them to save people from history because it's just so interesting. God, I love learning. I am a man of science, but something mysterious happened to me and now I have to tell you or else I feel like my house is gonna be the shiny. And what better way to face your fears than draw them? In the last history mystery, we drew the super soldiers of Shiloh. We also learned about the real life She-Hulk, Agnes Barr. But this one's personal cause things got weird once I learned about Tarara the man who was always hungry. I was trying to go to sleep one night when I looked at all your comments and a couple of you said, oh, do Tarara, everyone look up Tarara. But once I looked him up, everything got worse that night. Everything just went downhill. In the 1790s, there was this guy called Tarar who could literally eat anything and was always hungry. Not only was he constantly hungry because of his very fast metabolism, but it made him sweat all the time and it made him super stinky. You think that being an 18th century human vacuum would make you really large because of all the weight you were gaining, but guess what? He didn't gain any weight. At first looking him up, I got really sad and I was like, oh, poor guy, he lives on the streets because his dad couldn't feed him enough, so he got abandoned and now he just eats garbage and people's poop. I don't you heard me? He's eating people's poop. Have you ever been that hungry where you want to eat people's poop? It wasn't just that. He had a huge mouth that could open a foot wide and he had super elastic skin that he could wrap around like a belt. At this point in the night, I am freaked out by reading this because I didn't know that anyone could actually unhinge their jaws like they do in the cartoon. He joins the army because what else do you do in France in 1790? The guy literally becomes a military experiment when they start feeding him anything from dogs, cats, live fish. And then I thought he was kind of cool because then he becomes a secret spy and he fails his first mission and then he wishes for his powers to go away, but then he starts eating people. He's eating people, okay? The hospital couldn't feed him fast enough, so he starts eating dead bodies and maybe even a kid, we don't know. Just then I click on a picture of Tarar and immediately I start getting pop-ups from a virus, which is weirder because you can't get those on your phone apparently, so I'm just gonna turn it off, right? It is now pitch dark and I'm a little afraid. Yep, I am an adult male and I'm just a little afraid of the dark. And that's when dingoes outside my door start howling. So to recap, there are dingoes outside my door, I'm reading about a creepy guy that eats people, and poop, and now my phone has a virus and I don't know where I am or who I am. So in order not to be scared, I have to science. It wasn't a tapeworm. Some people today actually have the same problem that Tarara did, where they have to keep eating, and that's called polyphagia. This and a bunch of other conditions probably explain a lot of other things. In the autopsy, we learned that Tarara was just built different. If ever I'm afraid of a scary story, I like to think of the logic behind it. It feels a little more tactile, and I'm no longer scared of Tarar. Well, I'm kind of, okay, I'm sorry, I'm kind of, oh, I'm kind of scared of Tarar. This guy did not care that he ate bodies and poop. I know that we said he probably didn't have a tapeworm because it didn't show up in the autopsy after he died, but come on, I mean, it looks kind of scary. It reminds me of the Studio Ghibli No Face character from Spirited Away. Tarar is probably the scariest person I've ever researched from history. I mean, if the stories are true, it is 300 years old. I hope it's not true. Without further ado, here is Tarar. Ow! Understandably, I am still terrified of him. Who from history should I draw next? Did you know that the first person to write a computer program was not only 200 years ago, but they were 1,000% a baddie. We've got her to thank for cat memes and the internet in general. She helped create the world's first computer with Charles Babbage. Imagine Bridgerton and Back to the Future, but this time Marty McFly was super hot. Smash. She might have been living life like Pride and Prejudice, but she saw the world like it was the Matrix. Her mom just made her sit still for hours. She spent the whole time thinking about math and robots. She helped Babbage get his analytical engine going, just like she helps me get my engine going. Super genius old guy who for some reason hated street performers. They called the guy who hated mariachi bands the grandpa of computers. The female Marty called herself the enchantress of numbers. Mwah. Digimon and Code Lyoko had nothing on Ada Lovelace. She had an insatiable thirst for knowledge that nothing in the 1840s could quench and if she was alive today she'd probably hack the Pentagon. Here is Ada Lovelace. Whoa, oh my god. You've got a friend coming. Wait, why are your eyes green? <gasps> it's the Anical Engine. Oh, but it's a giant robot. I love what you've done with the world's first computer. Getting some Iron Giant vibes. I heard it ran on punch cards. I did not know it was gonna run on punching people. What superhero mystery should I do next? <laughs> Fun fact. 
Daredevil existed 200 years ago and fought slavery. Even though he was blind, James Holman was the ultimate sightseer. Blind Sherlock Holmes could tell how much money you made just from hearing your footsteps and used his skills to travel around the world. Literally. No, he like went around the world. He also had to touch things to see them, which got him in trouble and also in prison. He used a metal tipped walking stick to listen to ricocheting sounds. Using echolocation, Holman learned how to ride a horse in Africa, outran a stampede of elephants in Sri Lanka and helped free 330 slaves from pirate slaving ships. Imagine him fighting pirates on a ship. One of his best friends was a fellow traveler who was deaf. They traveled together for years and formed a deep friendship, quote unquote, wink wink. So if anyone in the comments questions why this badass was traveling the world, he said, we're all blind in some way and that is so badass. This one was a real eye opener for me. Ha! I bet you didn't see that one coming. Cause he's blind. If you were to stop what you're doing and become a superhero, what would you name yourself? Anything you come up with is better than what these guys thought of. In a tragedy of human hubris, a group of masked vigilantes fought crime from headquarters in caves like Batman, only to see themselves become the villains. What was their name? The Ball Knobbers. <laughs> Might as well have called yourselves the Manscapers. It doesn't mean hairless wiener, it means a hill with no trees on it, which is where this Justice League of Idiots first met. Looters were taking advantage of the chaos after the Civil War. Led by the most Ron Swanson of men I've ever seen, they decided to protect their families by fighting crime. They dressed up as devils to scare evildoers in their duels. And the best part is their stupid name! <laughs> Mating adjourned, we are the bald knobbers. Don't you think it sounds a little bit like shaved pee? Cletus, we told you, get your mind out of the gutter. No one's gonna think that. Especially not 200 years from now. Eventually, these Fantastic Four Nicators had the power get to their heads. The Asinine Avengers succeeded in taking out murderers and thieves until they became murderers and thieves. What did you expect? You dressed up as Lucifer. The group with the most villain arc storyline I've ever heard of deserves to be drawn as a comic book super villain. And the moral of the story is if you're gonna be a villain, choose a name that ages well. I give you the silliest villains in history, the bald Knobbers. I don't care if you're heroes or villains, you're not gonna be taken seriously with that name. I'm sorry you're associated with him. Sounds like the assless chaps. What? No, I'm not making fun of your name. I love the rubbing Johnsons. I mean, smooth ball sacks. I mean, no, 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 no. That's super sweet. I can't do that because superheroes' lives gets weird at the end sometimes. Like the story of David Hahn, the radioactive Boy Scout. He got this nickname because he created a nuclear reactor in his backyard. It was the real life Jimmy Neutron. The EPA got called on this Boy Scout because of course, this is what would happen in real life if Jimmy Neutron was real. You can't keep radioactive material as a child. You know that same exact EPA group that got hired to clean up the Boy Scout's backyard? You know what they got paid in? Exposure. <laughs> That's the end of the story, right? I drew a pretty picture. You can walk away now. No. The radioactive Boy Scout grows up. Give a mouse a radioactive cookie, he's just gonna keep looking for more radioactive cookies. In an FBI investigation, they asked him, hey, do you have any radioactive material? And he was like, huh, no way. Thanks to the neighbors, they found one in his freezer. The neighbor also said the radioactive Boy Scout was hallucinating and thought that people could electrify his testicles with their minds. Which is why I'm stopping the story here. He gets superpowers and that's it. And I don't, I don't wanna know about the testicles part. Have you ever gotten in an argument over something super stupid and it goes way too far? None of it can compare to the time a man lost his nose for saying he was good at math. On December 29th, 1566, Tycho Brahe, an extremely wealthy Danish astronomer, got drunk with his cousin Mandrup Parsberg and started arguing about who was better at math. Which is funny because he wasn't much of a party animal. In fact, he had a party animal. It was a moose and he sent it to parties to replace him. A few times he did party, he ended up fighting the cousin once in the dark and once while drunk, which led to him getting a giant scar on his face and losing part of his nose, which he replaced with a copper one. I looked up if the copper turned to skin green, but nobody knows. Here is Tycho Bra. Oh man, he got in a fight because he knows too much, and now he knows too little. <laughs>